So tonight, I'm going to um, talk about the teaching of the second arrow. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with, I think probably most of us, you know, know the phrase, pain is inevitable, suffering optional. Um, so, and I, I just kind of heard, I'd never really looked in depth to see what the original teaching was from um, and how useful it can be to examine it and to, to find ways to deal with it. Um, and how I didn't realize how much of this teaching is about reactivity. It's not just about the difference between pain and suffering, but what happens in between that moment where pain turns into suffering. Um, and uh, really for those of you that don't know, the gist of it is if someone gets struck by an arrow, instead of just the first arrow, instead of just pulling it out, do you ruminate, do you, do you strike yourself with a second arrow by saying, how could someone do this to me, and why is this always happening to me? So that would be the second arrow, is the story that you're making about this first experience, instead of just dealing with the experience at hand. So um, in looking up some of my old notes about this, um, I found a New Yorker cartoon, which is always such a great um, you know, source for Buddha, Buddhist principles. And there was one that said, it was, takes place in hell, and there's um, a bunch of cubicles. I don't know if people know this one. There's a bunch of cubicles, and um, inside each cubicle is a person who's in hell, and there's different levels of flame in each cubicle, and above there's two devils, and they're looking down on the cubicles, and one devil says to the other, we're always looking for new ways to increase suffering. <laughs> and I really can relate to that, because boy, you know, sometimes it feels good to make up a great story about why something is happening to you. So tonight I'll, I'll start with the text, and um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I thought it would be interesting to go into the biology of, what, of why this sort of thing can start happening to you. And then, um, and then different ways that we can maybe stop it from happening. So um, this translation of the um, second arrow teaching is in the Samyutta Nikaya, which is from the Connected Discourses. And it was translated by um, Tenasaro Bhikkhu. And so when the Buddha says run of the mill person, he just means someone who's not a monk. He's not slamming the person. <laughs> just means he's not a monk. Monks, an uninstructed run of the mill person feels feelings of pleasure, feelings of pain, feelings of neither pleasure nor pain. A well-instructed disciple of the Noble Ones also feels feelings of pleasure, feelings of pain, feelings of neither pleasure nor pain. So what difference, what distinguishing factor is there between the well-instructed disciple of the Noble Ones and the uninstructed run-of-the-mill person? The Blessed One said, When touched with a feeling of pain, the uninstructed run-of-the-mill person sorrows, grieves, laments, beats his breast, becomes distraught. So he feels two pains, physical and mental, just as if they were to shoot a man with an arrow and right afterward were to shoot him with another one so that he would feel the pains of two arrows. As he is touched by that painful feeling, he is resistant. Any resistance with regard to that painful feeling obsesses him. And touched by that painful feeling, he delights in sensual pleasure, meaning he wants it to stop. Why is that? He doesn't discern, as it actually is present, the origination, passing away, allure, drawback, or escape from that feeling. And as he does not discern the origination, then any ignorance with regard to that feeling of neither pleasure nor pain obsesses him. So I hadn't really realized the role of ignorance, at least according to the Buddha, that was in this teaching. And we can say it makes sense, well, ignorance causes suffering because maybe you're suffering because you're, you're not seeing the whole picture, but um, there's an ignorance in letting it get that far, I think, in a way, if you 
maybe because you don't have the skills to stop it from happening. So there's resistance, there's reaction, there's review. It's the three R's I like to remember. <laughs> so you're pushing away, you're reacting, and you're reviewing, you're making up a story about applying things from the past or hopes for the future into this one moment instead of responding skillfully. My daughter just started middle school, and um, I was recalling one of my most painful memories to her in sixth grade when um, we were playing dodgeball in PE. And she was kind of horrified, because I don't think that they do this anymore, thankfully. But, you know, one team has all the kickballs, and the other team has no balls, and they're lined up, and the first team just tries to, like, you know, throw the crap out of the other team until they're out, and they're done. And I was very tall and not athletic, and my last name is Good, and I was a goody two-shoes, so I was like the perfect target for people, and I could just imagine their glee as they just were ganging up on me and hitting me. And, you know, I thought, this is really, this is, this life does not change. I mean, this is the metaphor. Like, do you feel like these things are always coming at you? So that's like the second arrow, is they're always coming at, why, why me? Why are they always picking on me? And the truth is, life isn't. You know, life is just happening. Um, the more separate that you feel, then the more suffering there is. Because you aren't separate. I mean, you have teammates up there too, and they're getting, they're getting all the balls thrown at them too. Um, so I, I was thinking, you know, life does feel like a bad game of dodgeball sometimes. And how can we, how can we dodge this? Um, but we all know that the reality is, is that if we're human, we're going, to suffer, we're going to get sick, we're going to feel pain, and we're going to eventually die. And even if you were, depending on what tradition you're from, if you were enlightened, um, you'd still feel those feelings of, of pain and sorrow and eventually death. Um, the Buddhist teachings also say that um, this is not really what causes the misery in our lives. What is causing the misery in our lives is that in trying to avoid pain and seek happiness, um, we're kind of caught in the story of like, if only, if only I would do the right thing, if only I was more skillful, if only then I could stop. I could just stop these things from coming at me. And we can't really, but we, sometimes we can scoot out of the way, you know, in time with our skills. Um, and um, I'm sure we can all think of that feeling of, you know, as something painful is happening, there's like, like a terror involved, like this feeling of no control. <clears throat> and I found in this one reading of this teaching that um, the Buddha wrote a poem about this, supposedly. I can only go by <laughs> what it said. Um, and supposedly this poem is what inspired him to look for an end to suffering. And in this poem, he uses a Pali word called Sam Vega, which sounds like a stage name, but it's Sam Vega. And it's, the thing about Pali, as I mentioned before, is it can encapsulate a concept instead of just a description of a feeling. And so Sam Vega is this feeling of, of terror and dismay and... Um, um, alienation that may come just from living. So this is what the Buddha wrote. I will tell you of how I experienced San Vega. Seeing people floundering like fish in small puddles, competing with one another. As I saw this, fear came into me. The world was entirely without substance. All the directions were knocked out of line. Wanting a haven for myself, I saw nothing that wasn't laid claim to. Seeing nothing in the end but competition, I felt discontent. And then I saw an arrow here, so very hard to see, embedded in the heart. Overcome by this arrow, you run in all directions. But simply, on pulling it out, you don't run and you don't sink. 
so whether or not he really wrote that, I don't know. But it's, I think it's, it's beautiful and it's, um, you know, we're in the puddle. We're, we think that we're just a fish competing for things. Um, and that is not just what we are. Um, in trying to s stop this from happening, because stopping is also you know, resistance, so that's not so great either. Um, but we can see where it is that we get hooked in it. And Pema Chodron talks about this a lot, and she, she refers to it as shenpa, which is a Pali word, but it means attachment. But she talks about it a lot as when we get hooked. So, you know, have we already got, have we already t taken the bait? When this, this, has the story already started before we've even dealt with the, the painful instant at hand? <clears throat> and um, the second arrow is, is, is sort of, you know, we're all creatures of habit. So part of it, it, it I think it comes from a biology basis of, you know, are, are are trying to survive. You know, we're primed to try to be defensive, and if something hurts us, we want to find any which way we can to get rid of it. But what's interesting is, like, instead of really just getting rid of it, we 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 get a story out of it, <laughs> and it doesn't stop. And so I'm sure some of you have heard of the the. Um, term ne negativity bias. Rick Hansen talks a lot about that, how that is how we evolved about we were primed to look for negative things um, so we could survive. Um, and because we don't necessarily have to do that anymore, but we're still reacting that way. And um, Tara Brock has an interesting analogy of this that she calls the limbic hijack, which, um, and I'm not a biologist, so um, I, you know, I'm kind of only going by what she says, but um, you've got your limbic system, and um, when something bad ha happens to you, like someone cuts you off, you get in a car accident, um, you get some bad news, it can be so bad you just flip your lid, and it's happened so fast, you just, you, you know, you're flipping your lid, she calls it a limbic hijack. So what's what's happened? It's it's instantly happened, and um, before you've even had a chance to control it. But if you notice it's happening, I mean, I've even said to myself, you know, okay, I'm hijacking here. Let's just back up, take a breath, and um, biologically, what's happening according to Rick Hansen, is that we've got our sympathetic nervous system, which has been engaged. <clears throat> and the, a wake-up signal has been sent to the brain. And norepinephrine is stimulated. We've got stress hormones. Cortisol is happening. Your heart rate's happening. You're, you're breathing fast. You're exchanging more oxygen in your lungs. Your emotions intensify. And you are mobilized for action. What's not happening is that your prefrontal cortex is thinking logically. So in some ways, I mean, you know, it's not a mistake for this to be happening. <clears throat> um, but we don't just have our biology, we have our mind. And we have our skillful means. And the Buddha was aware of this. Um, he called it papanka, which again, another term that is it sort of brings a lot of concepts together, but he thinks that some of the pain that's happening is because there's objectification. So you start feeling separate. You're just like the fish in the pond. You feel like you're the only fish, and oh my god, all these other fish are out to get me. And um, I'm, I'm me, and I'm thinking I'm me, and I'm thinking I have a problem, and I'm thinking that this problem is encapsulating all these other problems. And he calls that papanka, which comes up um, a lot in this teaching, that it's the perception of this condition that is what's causing conflicts. Because we're thinking that we're a separate object and we're objectifying others and we think that um, we're in this situation, 
that's what's causing the suffering. When all that may be happening is just events that are either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, and those things are happening. And um, our sense of self is either going to get super reinforced and defensive and reactive or not. Um, I think it's interesting that sometimes when, if you can take any situation, um, like when I, in the meditation, when I was asking a question, like, you know, is there a difference between <clears throat> feeling pain or feeling wounded? Because wounded kind of implies a bigger story. Um, is that <coughs> sometimes when people feel bad or when they say that <coughs> something happens and so I feel bad, that means I am bad. And it's kind of a leap, but it really... It's, it, it happens, and I don't know why it happens. I mean, it just doesn't make sense, but it's okay to feel the feelings. And the way that I've been taught to <clears throat> stop pain from turning into suffering is to hold a space for the feelings without interpreting what they mean, without trying to figure, like, how does this fit in with therapy? How does this, you know, fit in with my past or my family? But just to feel those feelings and know that it's okay to feel those feelings. It still may not be the whole picture, but those feelings are what keeps you in the present. And um, I know Jack Cornfield would always say, your feelings are real, but they're not true. <laughs> I think it took me years to sort of get a handle on that, but because we can't ever know what's true. I mean, we'll never know all the causes and conditions. Um, we know what's happening to us, you know, especially if it's a physical pain. And if you're in physical pain, then you need to deal with the physical pain. It's not really a time to get all mental, but like, let's take the arrow out. Let's deal with the pain. Like, let's, especially if it's, if it's a, something that, um, you know, can be addressed with uh, a medical situation or something. Um, but do we ever know what's true? I mean, what's really true? And um, sometimes I also think if you can't snap out of it, you can say, well, what, what, where isn't it true? You know, the Buddha talked a lot in the negative to sort of say what something isn't to let you know what it is. Um, so, I mean, these are just suggestions to try to nip the situation in the bud because, you know, our stories are just, they're part of who we are, but they're not who we are. And, um, you know, sometimes it, you lose a little bit of your identity if you, if, you, if you drop the story about some sort of long-term emotional pain that you're, you're having. I mean, you know. It, it can be painful to drop the story. Um, I also think it's okay to know when to disengage from other people who are like masters of the second arrow. Like, it's really... <laughs> I mean, I have a wonderful friend I work with, but gosh, I just have to sometimes go, you know, this guy's making an art form. And I, you know, also that, you know, that's not also the time for me to say, well, there's this teaching of the second arrow and that's what you're doing in your second arrow. You know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, I think a lot of the times, you know, what's needed is, you know, he just, you know, loving kindness. You know, if he's, if, if someone that's a friend or you care about and, you know, that's a really painful place to be in, that you are so attached to your story that you can't see it any other way. Um, in trying to sort of slow down this process and allow these feelings um, to just be what they are, um, 
it's an opportunity to be to let some transformation in sometimes to um, you know to to recognize your pain and see where it takes you instead of trying to go to some sort of end game with it. Um, Cause pain is pain. I mean, it's not a fun place, but it's the reality of life. Um, Pema Children also talks about, um, at this point, this is where some bravery and courage can really go a long way. Is that, I mean, it takes bravery to, to train yourself to have an unconditional, she would call it friendliness, but an a inquiry attitude instead of a pushing away attitude. It takes bravery to stay with pain as it arises, to not bite the hook when someone dangles it in front of you. Um, and we're still gonna feel painful feelings. We're still gonna probably be betrayed or lied to or hated. Um, but I, I think what's not happening is you're not taking the bait. And it, it can, I think on the plus side, you can gain an emotional maturity from trying to do this. You know, at least trying to say, I wanna experience this in, is in a new way, not just sort of let, let myself get hijacked. Um, so just a few more things that um, I think that Gil Fronsdale talks about emotional maturity when you're sort of in this situation is um, it's very much just like any Vipassana meditation where you can do a naming practice about what's happening um, to recognize that you're having a range of emotions without trying to alter what those emotions are. Um, <clears throat> and he also made a point that if you stay in your body while you're doing this, the body is a bigger container than the mind. I thought that was really interesting that, you know, your body might have more information for you than this mind that's happening. And it's just something to, I think, experiment with. Um, you know, whenever I've led meditations, I, I always like to try to it somehow have a touch point of the body to the ground and, you know, be thankful that we don't have to worry about spinning off into space. You know, we don't worry about that. It's like we had a retreat this weekend with Matt Flickstein and he said, um, you know, freedom can be like gravity. You're not constantly worrying about is it there, is it there, what does it look like? You know, you're just sort of it's just good to know it's there. You may not always like appreciate it or understand it, but you know it's there. And just knowing that even a concept of something being there, I think, can be helpful. Um, and finally, um, you know, like I said before, offering loving kindness in those moments of not really knowing why this is happening or which way it's gonna go, it goes a long way. Um, so um, before we get to any questions, um, I did look up the rules of dodgeball because I wanted to get very clear on like what, you know, this, this obviously pivotal point in my middle school history. And because I didn't even know there are, there are rules for it. And they are on the internet, and um, there's nine short rules, and then I sort of turn them into how we could use this in this in this talk. Um, so number one, so this is how to play how to play dodgeball. One, stay behind and let your teammates get the balls unless you're really good. And I thought that's good advice. You know, we can't control everything that's happening. We control our our reaction, and we can get out of the way. If we can't, that's okay. Two, when throwing, don't be afraid to turn sideways and almost fall, then catch yourself to increase your power. Um, 
So I t took it as the time for awareness of the second dart is as soon as the first one comes. And this is our opportunity that even when we're falling, we can catch ourselves. Three, to catch a ball, let it come to you. Don't go to it. That seems, you know, keep pretty, pretty good advice. Keeping a softness without being rigid um, can help. And um, my very first teacher at Spirit Rock, Howie Cohn, um, said this every single time I sat with him, which was, you can always find a reason to be a witness for the prosecution, which is so true. You can sit there and argue your suffering till the end of time if you need to, but, you know, let's, you might not want to do that. Four, when dodging, always be ready to jump as they will most likely go for your feet. Uh, so pay attention to your body with what's happening. Five, this is my favorite one. Think of the game as war. Pretend that you're fighting for your life and you are facing your greatest rival because you are. <laughs> and I think your greatest rival is delusion. Uh, six, pay attention to all directions. Uh, be mindful, be present. Seven, a good strategy is to get some friends. Um, I think that you can really lean on your Sangha and lean on your Dharma friends. And um, I highly recommend getting one or two people or more in your life that you really can talk about your life in terms of the Dharma. Eight, do not show any mercy whatsoever <laughs> for the second arrow. Um, and finally, um, nine, the most important thing is, of course, to practice. <laughs>